sniffing at you this morning. It's a rare condition this day and age to read any good news on the newspaper page. Love and tradition of the grand design. Some people say it's even harder to find. For Vince, there must be some magic clue inside these gentle walls. Cause all I see is a tower of dreams. Real love bursting out of every seam. As days go by, it's the bigger love of the family. All right, give it up for Rachel. She got volunteered to do that. Um, she was like, no, I don't want to do this. I'm like, well, how did you do it? So the entire worship team volunteered to do that. We had to change it up a little bit as we finish up our series, Family Matters. We have been talking about the importance of family because if you win at home, you win at life. That as your home goes, so your life goes. So in this series, we've been talking about how to win at home because it's not easy to win at home, especially when you have family members who make really stupid decisions, right? Has anybody got any people in their family who just make terrible decisions, You're right? Yeah, yeah. And the thing I've noticed about foolish family members is that they love comparing themselves to geniuses, right? Like you have that, that family member, you know, that drops out of college and you try to talk to them about it and they're like, yeah, you know, Bill Gates dropped out of college. Yeah, to start a billion-dollar software company. You're waiting on a callback for the bachelorette. That's not the same thing. It's a little different there. You know, you got that family member that just keeps making the same mistake over and over again. You try to talk to him about it. You're like, well, you know, Thomas Edison took him 3,000 tries before he made the light bulb. Yeah, and every time it didn't work, he was taking notes about what he could do better the next time. You put the wrong password into iTunes 17 times, and when it didn't work, you threw your computer against the wall, right? That's, that's totally different, right? You try to talk to that family member, you know, about, you know, actually getting a job that pays money, right? Not their passion project, and like, look, you need to get a job, you need to make some money, and they're like, man, you know, Steve Jobs started Apple in a garage, you know, like, yeah, he was working out of a garage. You're 45, still living in your mom's garage. It's not, that's not the same thing, you know? Sometimes they even, like, compare themselves to, like, world-class athletes. You know, if you go three for 10 in baseball, you get into the Hall of Fame. Well, yeah, they're trying to hit a 99-mile-an-hour fastball. Only thing I asked you to do was pick me up from the airport. If you go three for 10 on airport pickups, you're not getting into the Uber Hall of Fame, all right? It's not going to happen. You know, family relationships can be some of the most difficult and complicated relationships in our lives. Family can be the source of our greatest joy and our deepest sorrow. And the thing about family relationships is that they're different than every other kind of relationship in our lives. Because if you have a problem with, you know, your best friend, if they do something that hurts you, if they betray your trust, you just get a new best friend, right? You break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you just get another one. You don't like your boss, get another job. You don't like your neighbor, move, right? In every relationship in our lives, all right, if we don't like, if things aren't working, we don't like what's going on, we just replace that person with somebody else. But it doesn't work that way with family. And I think sometimes we try to treat family relationships like every other kind of relationship in our lives. And so when things aren't working, when the downside uh, of doing life with this person is more than the upside, we just get rid of them, right? If they do something that hurts us or offends us, we just cut them off. But it doesn't work that way with family, right? Because you can get a new boss, a new boyfriend, you know, a, a new neighbor, but no matter what your mom does, she's always going to be a mom. Regardless of the decisions your father has made, he's still your father. No, no matter how many problems your sister has, she's still your sister. No matter what issues your brother has, he's still your brother. No matter what your son or daughter has done, it doesn't change the fact that they're your kid. And there are no replacements for family relationships. We can't just close the door on our relationships, right? Those don't work with family relationships. So today, I want to talk about pursuing reconciliation when it comes to our families. I want to talk about fighting for those difficult family relationships in our lives. I don't know if you've seen this picture before, but this is a picture of this girl on her first day of school. This is before her first day of school. She's all dressed up, looking nice, ready to go to school. This is her after her first day of school. <laughs> 
This is the before and after. I think she's had a rough day at school, right? And sometimes I think this is what we look like before spending time with family and then after spending time with family, right? Like, like family relationships can be difficult. Like there's nothing like family to wear us out and beat us down, right? Family relationships can be extremely difficult, but family is worth fighting for. Those relationships are worth fighting for. Now, I understand that for some of you today, nothing I'm going to say today is going to apply directly to you because you have a great relationship with your family. And that is awesome. You need to thank God for that. But chances are you know somebody who's got family brokenness in their life. And so you'll be able to use what you hear today to maybe help them. For others, this message is going to hit real close to home. And it's going to be extremely personal because you have a broken relationship with a mom, a dad, a son, a daughter, or a brother, or a sister. Maybe you're here today, and you wouldn't describe the relationship as broken, but it's hanging on by a thread, right? You're, you're close to just calling it quits and closing the door on that relationship. And so my hope today is that this message will encourage you, no matter where you're at, that this message would encourage you to continue to fight for those family relationships because family is worth fighting for. And one of the reasons why family is worth fighting for is because the desire to connect never goes away. That, that no matter what you know, you've done to them, no matter what they've done to you, the desire to connect never really goes away. Right? The desire for a son or daughter to have a relationship with their mom and dad is one of the strongest desires in the human heart. And no matter what they've done, the desire to connect is still there. And vice versa, the desire for a parent to have a relationship with their son or daughter is, is, is one of the strongest connections in the human heart. And the desire to connect, no matter what's happened, is still there. It, it might be buried under a lot of pain and disappointment and heartache, but that desire to connect is still there. And one of the clearest examples of this in Scripture is found in 2 Samuel chapter 13. It's the story of David and his son Absalom. And so David was king, and he had multiple wives. Now, the thing you need to understand is that there were things that people did in the Bible that God never approved of. And having multiple wives was one of those things. People say, well, yeah, but God never punished them for it. That's because having multiple mother-in-laws is punishment enough. And so edit this out in case my mother-in-law watches, um, and she does, so make sure we take that out. Um, so uh, he had multiple wives and, you know, multiple mother-in-laws. He had multiple, you know, kids with these women, which caused some problems because uh, David's firstborn son, Amnon, falls in love with his half-sister, Tamar. And so Tamar rejects him, and Amnon rapes her. Becomes this, you know, everyone in the family finds out about it. It's a huge disgrace to the whole family, and to make matters worse— David doesn't do anything about it. And so Tamar's brother from the same mother, Absalom, is angry, right? He, he's mad at Amnon for what he did, and he's mad at his father David for not doing anything about it. And so after waiting for two years for David to do something, he decides to take matters into his own hands. And so he throws this big old party for all of his siblings, and he invites Amnon. And when Amnon shows up at the party, Absalom kills him. And you thought your family was dysfunctional. Right, this family's got more drama than a daytime soap opera, right? And so after this, right, after he kills him, right in front of everyone, all the siblings start going, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. No, they, they didn't do that. Just making sure y'all still paying attention. Okay, so, so after this, Absalom goes to live in Jeshur. He's, he's separated from the rest of his family, and he has no relationship, no contact with his father for three years. And this is what it says, Second Samuel chapter 13. Verse 39, and King David, now reconciled to Amnon's death, longed to be reunited with his son, Absalom. So in spite of everything that happened, David still had a desire to connect with Absalom, but Absalom still had a desire to connect with David, right? Even after the, the rape, the murder, the shame, the humiliation, the desire to connect was still there. So David sends for Absalom and, and, and calls him to move back to Jerusalem. And so Absalom moves back to Jerusalem, but David doesn't go and see him for two years. And so the desire to connect is still there, but David is, is obviously having a hard time getting past the past. And so finally, after two years of, of being in Jerusalem, five years after not seeing his son, he finally goes to see him 
in person and they embrace and David, you know, gives them a kiss. And it, it is this incredible Kodak moment. But this was actually the last time that they ended up seeing each other face to face. And we don't really know why. Maybe there was too much water under the bridge. Maybe they couldn't just get past the past. Maybe they couldn't let go of the things that had happened. But this is the last time that they saw each other. And so Absalom's sorrow over not being able to have a relationship with his father turned into anger. And that anger turned into him leading a rebellion to try and take over as king. But he ends up dying in the process. But the root of that rebellion was rejection. It was a relationship with his father that was never reconciled. And so you can see that even in the midst of all the heartbreak, the dysfunction, the drama that happened in this family, the desire to connect was still there. And, and maybe that's why God wants us to continue to pursue relationships with our family. In spite of the pain, the heartache, the trauma that may have been in your family's past, God wants you to pursue reconciliation. Now, I know that when I talk about, you know, pursuing reconciliation with your family, there are some of you here, as soon as I said that, your first thought was, it's not going to do any good, right? The main reason why we don't pursue reconciliation is because we don't think it's going to work. We don't think anything good is going to come out of this. In fact, maybe you say, you know what, I've tried in the past, and it didn't work, so there's no use in trying again. And that's exactly what Jacob thought when God told him to go back and reconcile with his brother Esau, who wanted to kill him. Now, I have a, a brother. I'm 15 years older than my brother Gabriel. He's uh, the worship leader. I think he was worshiping right here. He's a worship leader here at the church. Many people don't know that. Every time I say it, it's like some shock, you know. But uh, uh, my, I'm 15 years older than him, and I tortured him all the time uh, as a kid growing up. One time, I locked him out of the house in his underwear. Right, he was so mad. He's like banging on the door. He's like, "Let me in." I'm like, "You got to go around to the backyard." He's like, "The gate's locked." I'm like, "Climb the wall, dude. Climb the wall." So he's like climbing the wall in his undies, you know. And he was he was so mad about that. Oh, where I grew up in Vegas, we have these moths that are like the size of butterflies. These things are huge, right? They're not like the little ones here. I mean, these things are massive, and so they're always flying around the light in front of our house. And so I would catch them. I'd hold it in my hand, and then I'd go and I'd pin him to the floor. And I would have, like, my knees on his arms, and then I'd cup the moth over his face. And he'd be flapping on his face. And he's like, Ugh! and he's screaming and crying with this moth just flapping all over his face. Yeah, it's just terrible. One time, I even put him in the dryer and turned it on. Don't worry, he only spun twice before I opened the door. Like, oh, my God, you know, just two spins. And he kind of had it coming. So, um, you know, but I did awful stuff to my brother but he never wanted to kill me. Now, I'm sure he wanted to put me in the dryer, but he, he, he couldn't. He couldn't, right? But he wanted to put me in the dryer, but, but he never wanted to kill me. He never threatened my life. But that's how, th how bad things had gotten between Jacob and Esau because Jacob tricked him out of his inheritance and stole his blessing. And so Esau said, look, if I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. And so Jacob ran for his life. And then God comes to Jacob and says, it's time for you to go back home. And Jacob knew that going back home meant reconciling with his brother. And, and Jacob said, God, it's not going to work. He wants to kill me. And God said, go anyways. And so it seemed like God was sending him on a suicide mission. I know for that, for some of you, the thought of, of reconciling with your mom, your dad, your son, your daughter, your brother or sister feels like a suicide mission, right? You feel like nothing good is going to come out of this. It's only going to cause more problems and more pain. But God tells Jacob to go even when Jacob didn't think it was going to work. And we can learn an important lesson from this story, and that's that God wants us to pursue reconciliation in spite of our expectations. It's okay if you don't think it's going to work. Just don't allow your expectations to keep you from taking a step towards reconciliation. Because when, when Jacob finally took that step of faith, look at what God did. In Genesis 33, verse 4, but Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And so in this case, God brought reconciliation even when Jacob didn't think it was possible. Now, some of you, you know, you, you hear that story. You think, yeah, you know, I tried that, and it didn't work, right? I tried to reconcile, and it didn't do any good, so I'm done. 
And I think part of the problem is what we define as good because we think good is when we write that letter, make that phone call, and they own up to everything that they've done. They take full responsibility for the breakdown in the relationship, and they apologize. That's what we think good is. And when that doesn't happen, we say it didn't do any good. But God defines success in different terms than we do because God wants us to pursue reconciliation even when the relationship isn't going to end with and they lived happily ever after. Like God wants us to fight for the relationship even if that person never responds and the relationship is never restored. And we think, why on earth would God want me to pursue reconciliation even if the relationship is never restored? Because it's the best thing you can do for your own peace of mind, well-being, and future happiness. Because when, whenever you close a door on a relationship and you say, that's it, I'm done, I don't want anything to do with them. Whenever you do that, all the anger, resentment, unresolved tension that you have begins to spill over into your other relationships. When you have unresolved family relationships, they begin to affect the other relationships in your life. And so although you may have cut that person out of your life and you have nothing to do with them, you're still carrying the baggage from that relationship. And many times what happens is we end up dumping that garbage into our marriage and into our relationship with our kids. I heard a story from one woman who had a, a, a difficult relationship with her father. Her father had cheated on her mother multiple times, ended up running off with another woman and started a whole new family. And so she tried over the years to have a relationship with her father over and over again and was just met with disappointment after disappointment time and time again. And so finally she just said, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to stop trying. And she closed the door on that relationship. And when she closed the door on that relationship with her father, all that, 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 that unresolved tension and frustration that she had with her father got redirected into her marriage and her relationship with her kids. And she began to see the toll that it was taking on her family. But she had the self-awareness to realize what was happening. And so she started pursuing a relationship with her father again. She opened up the lines of communication again. And although things never really got better with her dad, it completely changed her marriage and her relationship with her kids. See, sometimes the best thing you can do for you, for your marriage, for your relationship with your kids is to pursue reconciliation. Even if that person doesn't respond, even if, you know, the relationship is never restored, it's the best thing you can do for you because there's something about us pursuing reconciliation that allows God to change us and transform us into the person that he created us to be. You know, in Genesis 32, just before Jacob is reunited with Esau, Jacob has this encounter with God where God changes his name. See, Jacob's name meant deceiver. And that's what he did. He deceived and manipulated people to get ahead. But in, in Genesis 32, he has this encounter with God where God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And Israel means triumphant with God. And so Jacob goes from being a deceiver to being triumphant with God. But it happened as he was in the process of pursuing reconciliation with Esau. There's something about us being in the process of pursuing reconciliation that allows God to change us, transform us, and mold us into the person that he's created us to be. There's something about being in this process that God is able to do things in our lives that he wouldn't be able to do if we weren't in that process. That reconciliation doesn't just change the relationship, it changes us. That sometimes the process is just as valuable as the outcome because it's in pursuing reconciliation that we are changed and transformed. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. So Jesus gave his life for us to reconcile us, to bring us back into relationship with God with no guarantee that we would respond, right? In, in fact, he died for our sins knowing that many wouldn't respond, that many wouldn't choose to come back into a relationship with him, but he still died for them. 
And God said, now I want you to imitate me. I want you to do for others what I did for you. I want you to do to your family what I did for you. I want you to pursue reconciliation with no guarantee that they will respond. I want you to, to, to open the doors for communication again without knowing how this thing might end. Now, I know that for some of you, this might be the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. I understand it's a lot easier for me to get up here and talk about this than it is to actually walk this thing out because it's going to require a ton of humility. It's going to require you swallowing your pride to be the one to take that first step to reconcile, especially when they were the ones who wronged you. It's going to take so much humility to take that first step. But it's better to face the situation with humility now than to look back with regret later. Because there's going to come a time when they're no longer here and you're not able to have a relationship with them. And you're going to wish you would have written that letter that you would have made that call, that you would have tried one more time to reconcile and restore those things that are broken. You know, I've done funerals for, for families where the fathers and sons, you know, weren't on speaking terms. And it's always so hard for that person to deal with that loss because they didn't get to say everything they wanted to say. They didn't get a chance to do those things they wanted to do because they thought that they were going to have more time. But we just never know. And so that's why it's always better to live with humility on the front end than regret on the back end. And you never know what God might do when you actually take that step towards reconciliation. You know, Joyce Meyer is one of the most well-known Christian speakers and authors. I mean, she fills like stadiums with people who come to hear her teach. But when Joyce was growing up, she was sexually abused by her father over 200 times. And so she said she knows the exact number because she remembers every instance, every detail. And she tried to talk to her mother about it and her mother either didn't believe her or just didn't wanna do anything about it because she just kinda ignored it, nothing changed. And so as soon as she was old enough, she moved out of the house and had nothing to do with her father. And so she later gave her life to Christ and when she started following Jesus, she knew that she needed to forgive her father. And so she went to her father and she said, I forgive you for everything that you've done to me. And he never even acknowledged that he had done anything wrong. And so over the years, she hadn't had much of a relationship with her dad because it's really hard to have a relationship with somebody who isn't able to acknowledge that kind of sin and offense and heartache that he actually caused. And so they didn't have much of a relationship. And one day God spoke to her and he said, I want you to buy a house for your father and I want you to take care of him until he dies. So she bought a nice house for her father, just eight miles down the road from where they live. She furnished it with all new furniture, even gave him a brand new car, and he never even said thank you. Four years after living in that home, her mother calls her one day and says, your father has been crying uncontrollably all week, and he said he needs to speak to you. And so she drives over to the house And her father says, I've done horrible things to you, and I'm so sorry. And he just repented right in front of her, asked for her forgiveness. And she could tell that her father had truly regretted the things that he had done. And so she shared the gospel with him and how God loves us in spite of the things that we've done. How Jesus died on a cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven. And she said, Dad, you need to give your life to Jesus. And he said, yes. And she prayed with him to receive Christ. He was baptized right after this. And she said that her dad was a completely different person from that day forward. Completely different person. And it wasn't long after that that her dad actually passed away. You see, Joyce made a decision to forgive her father and to pursue reconciliation with him, even though he never apologized, even though he never acknowledged that he had done anything wrong. She continued to fight for that relationship. And because of that, her father is in heaven today. So you never know what God will do in your life and in the life of your family when you pursue reconciliation. When you take a step in their direction, you never know what God will do. If you guys would please bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're here today, you know, we're talking about reconciliation, but the first 
type of reconciliation that needs to happen is that you need to be reconciled back to God. You need to receive the gift of salvation and the forgiveness that Jesus offers us because it's only when we receive his forgiveness, his love, and his grace that we are empowered to extend that love, that grace, that forgiveness with others, that we are filled with a love that enables us to take a step in the direction of those who have hurt us and wounded us and experienced reconciliation in our family. It starts with being reconciled to God, receiving that gift of salvation. So if that's you today, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. If that's you today, would you just slip your hand up in the air? I just want to see who I'm praying for today. Just slip your hand up in the air if you need to surrender your life to Jesus. You need Jesus to forgive you. Thank you. I see your hands. Thank you. God, I pray for those who lifted their hands to surrender their hearts and lives to you. God, I thank you that they are now reconciled to God, that all their sin, God, has been washed away. And that they are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. That you are in the process of mending, restoring, and making everything new in their heart and in their life. God, I pray that you would fill them with your presence in this moment right now. That they would experience that love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together for those who made decisions to follow Jesus? We would love for you to stop by our information tent right outside. We just want to give you this book. A fresh start to help you get started in this new journey. Hey, before you go, I also want to let you know about another resource that we have available. Um, a couple weeks ago, I did a, a message, and in just one point of my message, I talked about uh, sexuality in our culture. And after that message, I had a lot of people asking me questions about what the Bible says about homosexuality and same-sex marriage. So I decided to put together a, a three-part series called The Bible and Sexuality, where we go in-depth into God's plan for sexuality. Now, I know that um, speaking on this subject, you know, I know that this is like the most socially, relationally, politically, and now spiritually divisive subject. Uh, um, it, it's become like a lightning rod for criticism to stand up and speak publicly on this subject. I'm, I'm well, and that's why many pastors just avoid it altogether, right? They, they just want to stay as far away from this as they can. And trust me, I understand why. But in the absence of pastors and leaders teaching on this subject, it's led to a lot of confusion. And so Christians are wondering, is it, is it a sin to be gay? Is homosexuality a sin that must be repented of? Or if given the right context in commitment, is same-sex intimacy a blessing worth celebrating? And so in this series, I answer all of those questions and more. I'm able to go a lot deeper than I can on a Sunday morning. So we go in-depth into God's plan for sexuality. We answer uh, questions that people have, objections that people might have to what the Bible teaches, objections that you're going to hear in culture to the biblical view uh, of God's design for sexuality. We cover all of that in this series. And so if you're interested in checking this out, it's available on our app and on our website. But I, I really hope that you'll take the time to watch all three of those messages because this topic has taken center stage in our culture. And so it's important for us as the church to know what God's word says, to know what God thinks about this, as well as what our response is as a church to the LGBTQ community. Because this isn't just, you know, a hot topic. You know, this is dealing with people created in the image and likeness of God. So it's important for us to respond to this with grace and truth. And that's what I think this resource will help you and us do as a church. So we hope that you will check that out. If you guys would stand to your feet, I want to pray for you today. You know, I know that that this message content, the subject that we're talking about in this message today is very difficult. I, I understand that it raises more questions than answers because you didn't talk about how to do this and the right way to do it and when to stop when it's causing more pain than heartache and and I can't cover all of that and so and I don't exactly know how to walk this out perfectly because every situation every circumstance is unique and it's different and so I just want to pray that God will give you the wisdom and the understanding to know how 
to navigate these things because this is some of the most difficult and in, in uncharted waters, you know, for a lot of people. And and only the Holy Spirit can can help you navigate the difficulties of family relationships and the brokenness that people have gone through in this room. So I just want to pray for you that God would give you the wisdom, the understanding, the discernment to know what to do and when to do it. Let's pray. God, I pray for every person here, God, who has experienced brokenness, pain, where there's separation, God, where where people haven't talked to family members in years because of the things that have happened. God, I pray that you would give each and every person here wisdom, understanding, insight, that only the Holy Spirit can give them on how to, to walk through this. I just, just the picture that keeps coming to my mind as I'm praying is almost like walking through a minefield and you have no idea where those mines are and when they're gonna go off and only the Holy Spirit can tell you when to step and what to do and what to say and how to bridge that gap and pursue reconciliation. So God, I pray that we would hear your voice with, with clarity, that we would know exactly what to do. We'd have the wisdom to say what needs to be said and the wisdom sometimes to not say the things that we want to say. God, I pray that as we take these steps of faith, God, I pray that you would do what only you can do, that miracles of reconciliation would take place, that, God, family members like Jacob and Esau who just have been at odds with each other, who wanted to kill each other, there's been fighting and bickering for years, God, that they would be able to move forward, that relationships and, and families would be restored. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being here. Have a fantastic Sunday, and we'll see you guys next week.